So if you guys are just rolling in, I wanna welcome you all to today's Isotope Day featured um, cutting edge science facilitated by Stable Isotopes. So we're just gonna give it a couple more minutes for people to continue to log in and we'll get started in about a minute. Alrighty, so I believe we have a fair amount of people. So without further ado, let's get started. So I wanna welcome everybody that's here today to Isotope Day 2022, featuring cutting edge science facilitated by stable isotopes, NMR and other related techniques and technologies. My name is Kelly Andrade and I'm gonna be your host for today's event. So welcome once again, and a few goals that we aim to achieve in today's webinar is first and foremost, I hope that you all are able to explore the cutting edge applications of stable isotopes and learn something new from the expert panel of scientists that we have featuring their science today. I hope that each of you is able to strengthen your understanding of CIL's labeled products and the role we play in these research fields. And most importantly, we hope that you're able to stay engaged throughout the conversation and have some fun along the way. In case you missed it, we also had our mass spec portion of the Isotope Day last week, and most of the recordings from this segment will also be posted on our website along with today's session in the coming weeks. So if you missed that, don't worry, we have some of the talks recorded and you'll be able to view them on our website shortly. Our agenda for the day. And following this very brief introduction, we have a wonderful set of panelists today who will speak on a variety of different scientific approaches, incorporating stable isotopes and using NMR and other related techniques to help answer their research questions. Just a few notes to be aware of. After each set of the panelists is going to be giving their presentation, we will have a short minute or two of Q&A to follow each presentation. So if you have any questions at any point throughout today's talks, um, please feel free to go ahead and enter that in the Q&A box or in the chat feature in the Zoom link on the very bottom of your screen. And we'll make sure that we're able to address each and every one of those questions, whether it be in the Q&A portion after each presentation or via email after the fact. Most of these talks today will be recorded and disseminated after the fact. And just as a reminder, CIL products are labeled for research use only and diagnostic procedures. And to get us started, we're gonna go ahead and have a very brief poll. Um, it's just a three question survey, just so we get a better understanding of who we have in the audience, as well as what your areas of research are. So you should be seeing the pop-up screen on your screen right now. So go ahead and we'll give you about 35, 40 seconds to go through and answer these three questions. Alrighty, so we can go ahead and close out the poll. And I wanna thank each one of you that is present here with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for filling out the poll. And we're very grateful for your participation and being here with us today. So without further ado, we can jump right into the scientific talks that we have today. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give a brief um, overview about stable isotopes and biomolecular NMR and how they're kind of incorporated and why you may wanna use them in your research. And I'm sure many of you that are here with us today are all very familiar with who we are as CIL and stable isotopes because you're here. But in case you are not aware, I'm gonna be explaining a very little bit about the concept of incorporating isotopes into your research as well as who we are as CIL. So Cambridge Isotope Labs were the world's leading stable isotope company and were owned by Atsuka Pharmaceuticals. 
We specialize in the separation and manufacturing of stable isotopes and stable isotope labeled compounds, including 13C, deuterium, 15N, and 18O. We are a US-based company with a global footprint, and we have been in the business for over 40 years. And we have six locations all throughout the world, three of which are here based in the United States. We have our subsidiary located in France and Germany, known as Euroisotope. And we also have CIL Canada and CIL China. And we do have five of the locations that I just mentioned are equipped with CGMP laboratories. And as the world's leader, we are focused on isotope separation from natural abundance and the manufacturing, as I had mentioned. And as you can see here on this image on the right, this is a image of our 18O sep facility located in our Ohio location here in the US. And as you guys are probably more interested in the 13C, I would love to be able to show you what this separation apparatus looks like. But unfortunately, it's a little bit hard to do so because we have these columns built into the ground. So it's not always the easiest thing to go through and dig down just to get a photo. So this is what our 18O separations look like. Um, but we do have the capabilities and we do do a lot of 13C separation as well. We do have our deuterium recycling program and re-enrichment facility as well. And we do, once we have all of these isotopes and we separate them out, we then go through and we're able to manufacture isotopically labeled compounds on anywhere from a milligram up to multi-ton um, capacity and a scale. We do have over 15,000 products in our portfolio and some of which I'm going to be speaking with you about today. So our products um, do serve a wide variety of markets. They can kind of be bucketed into two separate business units, as we like to say. So we have our traditional research-based business, which is like our environmental products fall underneath that, our biomolecular NMR products, mass spec, metabolomics, and that all kind of falls into this traditional research-funded business. We also have commercial-based applications as well, which encompasses our 13C urea breath test, um, 18O water for PET scans, as well as our deuterated solvents and reagents for synthetic drug intermediates, as well as OLED applications. So if you see something on the screen and you're interested in it or you want to know more about these products, feel free to inquire with us. And more than we are more than happy to answer any questions you may have after the fact. And today I'm gonna to be speaking with you a little bit more detail about the biomolecular NMR product line. So as most of you are very well aware, NMR is a very useful and critical technology utilized in structural biology and drug discovery. It can be used to look at proteins and nucleic acid as to how these mo molecules behave in various states and different conditions. And when we have this, determining the 3D structure of these macromolecules, as well as aspects about their dynamics, such as how they move, how they bend, and how they bind to other molecules, can be difficult to do. But thankfully, we have NMR and other related techniques, such as cryo-EM and imaging, to be able to help us to do some of this critical information. This information can then be used by people just like you in the audience to help design new drugs and identify new drug tar targets, which is extremely cool. Not only is NMR a critical technology in obtaining information on the atomic and molecular level, but incorporation of stable isotopes is also critical for a variety of reasons. So the big question is, you may be asking is why are stable isotopes used in molecular bio, like biomolecular NMR? First and foremost, it can help increase signal strength. And as you may be aware, NMR is not inherently super sensitive, but you can increase the sensitivity by doing things such as getting a bigger magnet or increasing the concentration. But as you probably know, it's not the easiest thing to just go out on the market and buy a bigger magnet. <laughs> so that is one way that uh, stable isotopes can help. Um, incorporating them into your chemical workflow it can help increase the signal strength that we see. And when you get into larger molecules, um, anywhere in the 30 to 40 kilodalton range, they tumble slower and give broader lines. So incorporating some deuteration helps to increase the signal strength. 
stable isotopes also help to simplify the spectra. And as molecular size increases, um, the number of resonances also increases, and that leads to spectral overlap. So incorporating stable isotopes helps to simplify the spectra, reducing the spectral overlap. And once you have, um, you're able to increase the signal strength, once you're able to simplify the spectra, you can then get the information that you want, um, such as looking at the structure, determining the structure of the protein or NMR, or excuse me, the RNA complex, and going through and you can perform different experiments to obtain the spectral correlations to determine the structure. You can also study the dynamics and also study interactions. So studying interactions, for example, you can go through and look at how a potential drug molecule might bind to an enzyme. And this can be done on both small molecule and large molecule bindings. So regardless of if you're looking at proteins or more nucleic acids, the question kind of comes to be, how do you choose to label this molecule? Do you want to use 15N? Do you want to use 13C? Do you want to use a combination of both? Do you need to incorporate deuterium? And for proteins, kind of in general, the size and complexity matters. So when it comes to incorporating the stable isotopes, and in general, the larger your protein of interest is, the more isotopic incorporation you might need. Although there are other strategies that can be used to help gain information such as methyl labeling, sparse labeling. Um, we have amino acid selective labeling, which can also go ahead and help us determine how much um, isotopic incorporation we may need. If you're going through and you're looking at nucleic acids, looking at RNA, DNA, you can go through and you're gonna to wanna to be incorporating stable isotopes either by NTPs, nucleoside triphosphates, or through phosphoramidates. And NTPs are used for enzymatic synthesis of oligonucleotides. So all of the residues of each type will be labeled. For example, if you use uh, 13C adenosine triphosphate, all of the adenines in your complex will then be labeled. And if you go through and you're using phosphoramidates, you can go ahead and have more site-specific labeling for certain residues by going through and utilizing phosphoramidates for chemical synthesis. At CIL, our biomolecular product line is kind of broken down into these big categories. We have the nucleic acids, as I had just mentioned, our minimal media reagents, such as the glucose ammonium salts, our cell culture media for whatever type of cell culture you're looking for, whether it be E. coli, yeast, insect cells, mammalian cells, we do have a lot of rich media available. And we also have some methyl labeling components, such as alpha keto acids and pro-R and pro-S precursors. We do have a wide selection of amino acids as well, both uniformly and selectively labeled to achieve whatever type of isotopic incorporation you're looking for in your experiments. So you may ask what's new in this area. So here we just released very recently a new mini catalog for RNA and DNA related products. So we do have over 20 new products in this area such as specifically labeled ATP, pseudouridine, and purine biosynthesis intermediates. We also have some protein expression bundling sets that include 15N ammonium chloride and 13C6 glucose in amounts ideal either for a one liter or a 10 liter growth. So if you are not somebody who is very familiar with doing protein expression or not sure how to kind of get started, this would be really great product for you to be able to help you get started in this endeavor. We also have some new aromatic probes, such as specially labeled tyrosine and phenylalanine. And we do have this um, labeling pattern present here that's shown on the tyrosine, this double um, C we do have available in phenylalanine as well. And as you're gonna hear about in some of the talks, very interesting. It's become more prevalent lately, and the fluorine nucleus can be a very advantageous probe to use because it has a large chemical shift. And we do have a few of the panelists today that will elaborate a little bit more on this. So to help you in your RNA studies, um, we do offer some fluorinated nucleoside triphosphates and other related compounds for use in your research. And I'm not sure if we have any questions yet, but I 
does not look like it. So without further ado, we can jump right into the scientific talks. <laughs> 